Let me just add, Laurel, I, I had six years of piano lessons and can't play a lick, so <laughs> kudos to you. That was excellent. I do appreciate that. It is always good to see people serving God with the gifts that he has given them, so we thank you for that. John Wesley was born in 1703, the 15th child of Samuel Wesley, uh, the rector of Epworth, and his wife Susanna. John enjoyed a good upbringing. He had a brilliant career at Oxford and elsewhere. He served as pro uh, professor of Greek and logic at Lincoln College there at Oxford. He served as his father's assistant for a time and then he was ordained a priest in the Church of England in 1728. Returning to Oxford, he joined a group led by his brother Charles and George Whitfield that was dedicated to living holy lives. And even though Wesley wasn't yet saved, he met with these men for prayer, the study of the Greek New Testament, devotional exercises. He, he was setting aside an hour each day for prayer and reflection, he was taking communion every week, and he was trying to conquer every sin. He fasted twice weekly, he visited prisons, he helped the poor and the sick. And doing all of this helped him think that he was a Christian. In 1735, still unconverted, he accepted an invitation to become a missionary to the American Indians in Georgia. It was a fiasco. He failed miserably. When he returned to England after a couple of years here in the States, he wrote, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? His mission experience taught him the wickedness of his own heart. But all was not lost because in his travels on his way home, he met some German Moravian Christians. And their simple faith impressed him. And when he returned to London, he, he sought out one of their leaders and through a series of conversations with this man, to quote Wesley's own words, he was, quote, clearly convinced of unbelief, of the want of that faith whereby alone we are saved. On the morning of May 24, 1738, something happened that he would never forget. He opened his Bible randomly, and his eyes were drawn to the words from Mark 12, verse 34, where it says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Wesley said those words reassured him, and before he went to bed that night, he crossed that line from not being far to being a member of the kingdom of God. And that text became his life verse, a reminder of his first 35 years before he was saved. You are not far from the kingdom of God. That's part of our passage this morning as we continue through the book of Mark, so I'd encourage you to open to Mark chapter 12. We'll be looking at verses 28 through 34 this morning. Let's read it together, and, and then we'll get into it. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he, Jesus, had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, The foremost is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Well, the scribe said to him, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask Jesus any more questions. What an interesting passage. You know, if you've been with us as our, we're going through the Gospel of Mark, you realize this is the fifth encounter that Jesus has in the temple area during the week before his death. But this one is somewhat different from the others. It takes a surprising turn, if you will. Jesus and this scribe find common ground. And Jesus even commends this man. 
So let's look at it, beginning in verse 28. It says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, What commandment is the foremost of all? Now, consider the various leaders who have approached Jesus already. It's been the Pharisees and the Herodians in, in chapter 12, verse 13, the Sadducees in, in verse 18 of chapter 12. And now we see an expert in the law, a scribe. Uh, I think Matthew describes him as a lawyer coming to Jesus with a question. Now, you know, oftentimes when we think of scribes, we think of somebody just sitting on a desk writing all the time, right? Term copying. No, the, the, the scribes in Jesus' day, they were the, the, the professional interpreters, uh, the appliers of the Old Testament. They, they studied it. They knew it. They taught how it was to be applied. And it's interesting that scribes appear frequently, especially in Mark's gospel, but it's almost always in an adversarial role. But it's not so here. The, this encounter is surprising because every other question, every other challenge has had a hostile intent behind it. And, and this one probably did originally, but it didn't stay that way. We read in Matthew's account, he tells us this scribe is, is a Pharisee, and he asks this question to test Jesus. But as we read here in Mark, verse 28, hearing Jesus arguing with the Sadducees and seeing how he answered them, this scribe was impressed with Jesus and his answers. And he seems to be sincere as he asks his own question now. And so even though probably sent by the Sanhedrin to try to discredit Jesus, he seems to be more honest in his approach to Jesus than the others. And what this seems to, to, to tell us is that not all of the Jewish leadership is as opposed to Jesus as it often seems. Uh, this, this scribe comes with a different heart than the others. And, and yes, even though he was sent to test Jesus, he has an interest in Jesus. He has a respect for what Jesus has said. But he comes to him with a question that concerns the first or the most important of all the commandments. And these kind of questions were, were common in that day. The Jews at that time believed there were 613 laws given in the Pentateuch. Uh, 613 because that matched the number of letters in the Hebrew text of the Ten Commandments given in Numbers, okay? So, you know, you got to tie everything up in a nice, neat bow, and they did that. But they, they divided these laws into 248 positive commands, do this, and 365 negative ones, don't do this. And then they further split these commands into heavy laws, which are absolutely binding, and light laws, which are less binding. Confused yet? You know, when you taught your children to do this or don't do this, was it binding or not binding? Or is there in between? I don't know. Anyway, anyway. You know, even Jesus talked about the, the, the least of the commandments. You remember that? He talked, talked about the weightier matters of the law. But the rabbis, the, the scribes, were never able to arrive at a consensus as to which laws are heavy and which laws are light. And, you know, that's a dilemma we all face as well, especially when we tend toward legalism. Knowing they couldn't keep all 613 laws, the, the rabbis focused on keeping the heavy ones, the more important ones as they saw them. They, they hoped that doing so would satisfy God. But even that was a crushing, unbearable burden trying to keep these laws. So they constantly sought to reduce the list of heavy laws to a few key ones. And then unable to keep even those few laws, they focused on keeping their own man-made traditions instead, and that's where they drifted apart. So the scribe comes to Jesus here and says, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answers biblically, he recites Deuteronomy 6, Leviticus 19. We read it in verse 29 and 30. Jesus answered, The foremost commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater 
than these. You know, these verses from Deuteronomy chapter 6 were known by all the Jews. It's, it's the, the primary creed of their faith. It was quoted by Jews every morning and every evening. It was the opening sentence of every synagogue service and still is. It's called the Shema. It's uh, comprised of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, chapter 11, 13 through 21, and Numbers 14, 37 through 41. Go home, look it up, read it all, okay? It, but the title Shema comes from the opening word of Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, Shema. And Deuteronomy 6, 4 says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Do you notice there the, the object of their love was not to be, it, it wasn't an impersonal cosmic force, it wasn't an unnamed, unknown higher power? No. It was the Lord our God. The God that wants you to love him. And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God. That's the most important commandment. And he includes four, I don't know, modifiers of some sort. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now, if you notice in the Deuteronomy, it only had three, right? Equivalent to heart, soul, and strength. Why does Jesus step in here and add mind to this? I don't know. Maybe because of the Greek influence at the time, but, but we don't know and it doesn't change anything. There is a lot of overlap in all of these terms, meanings. Heart in Jewish thought was, was the seed of the physical, spiritual, and mental life. It's a seed of desires and feelings and affections, passions, impulses. It's the source of all thoughts, words, and actions. Uh, what does it say in Proverbs 4.23? Watch over your what? Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. And, and so Jesus says, you're to love God, and it must flow from the deepest part of your being. You know, I think we're all guilty at times of thinking, you know, I spent an hour at church this week. I've loved God. Now I can do whatever I want, right? No, that's not loving God with all your heart. With God, it's to be all or nothing. You know, love for God can't be tithed like we tithe our, our finances or our money. Uh, I think there's very few of us can, that can honestly sing, all to Jesus I surrender, right? Can we say that truthfully? But God requires nothing less. We love him with all our heart. It goes on. To love him with all our soul, it can mean the, the life principle, the seat of the inner human life. It's adding emotions to the equation. It's the motivating power that brings strength of will. In Matthew 26, Jesus said, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. His soul, the emotions, and then mind. Well, it's pretty simple. That's your cognitive functions, your thinking, your comprehending, your reasoning abilities. And the mind embraces the will, the intentions, the purposes. And so Jesus says we are to love God with our intelligence, if you will. We're to love him with the fullness of our understanding. We're to, we're to fully apply our minds to understand the riches and the depths of his revelation of himself and his word that he's given to us. And then strength is perhaps the most distinct of the four, refers to the, the vigor that motivates them all. The love that we're to have for God isn't to be a weak thing. It's not an impotent thing. We're to call on all our strength to express our love for him. And so by, by saying these four things, love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, it, basically love him with everything you are. The intellectual, the emotional, the volitional, the physical aspects are all to be involved in loving God. It's to be an intelligent love, an emotional love, a willing love, an active love. In short, it's an all-consuming love. And our love for God is to be seen in everything we do. It's not that idea that God is at the top of the list and after we check him off, we're free to do as we please. No. We don't just spend time with God in the morning, read our Bible, do a little prayer, and then walk away thinking, I've, I've loved God, now I don't have to think about it anymore today. No, that's not what God wants. He demands all of us, all of the time. 
We're to love him in everything we do. It's to be the center of everything. Love God with all your activities, with all your actions, with all your behavior, with all your life. You know, heart, soul, mind, and strength aren't separate parts of human life. You, you can't divide up life like that. It's a summary once again. All you are and all you do is to be because of your love for God. I mean, it, Jesus says it four times. Why? With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. How much heart, soul, mind, and strength are we to love God with? All. It's complete. And you know, if we're honest, we have to admit we have not kept this command for even a single day of our lives, not even for a single minute of our lives, probably. Think of it this way. If I were to ask you, what's the most serious sin of all? How would you answer that question? Well, some might say murder, you know, idolatry, unbelief, not believing, you know. But it seems to me that if the foremost commandment is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength, what's the greatest sin? Failing to do so. You know, that's scary. I haven't kept this command for five minutes straight in my entire life. I've never loved God with my whole heart. My soul has never overflowed with affection for God as it should. My, my, my mind has been lazy concerning understanding God and his word. I, I only use a portion of my strength to love God. I mean, that's scary, isn't it? I failed. I'm breaking this command. And were it not for Jesus, I'd perish because of this sin. And rightly so. And I hate to break it to you, but so would you. But thankfully, think of Jesus. Was there any part of his heart that wasn't completely in love with his father from all eternity? Did he ever restrain his soul from, from his affection for his father? Was there anything that the, the father revealed that Jesus ignored as being unworthy of his attention? Well, was Jesus' love for his father a spineless, weak affection? Or did he have the most powerful, strong affection for the father ever known? I mean, we know the answers to those questions. Jesus kept this command perfectly, did he not? Every moment, every second of his life, he loved the Father with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his mind, with all his strength. Had he not done that, he wouldn't have fulfilled the law of God. And if he would not have fulfilled the law of God, he wouldn't have been worthy to save even himself, let alone save us. We realize none of us can keep, none of us can perfectly love God as we're commanded to. None of us can keep his law as he requires. I mean, the Bible says time and time again, there is no man who does not sin. There is no one who does good. In God's sight, no man living is righteous. No one can say, I've cleansed my heart, I am pure from my sin. No, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. We can relate to that, can't we? You know, thankfully, this command to love God was not given as a means of salvation because we would all fail. Instead, as with the law, it's our tutor to what? To lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. You know, the Jews, Shema, and the rest of Moses' words throughout the Pentateuch, in Deuteronomy especially, should have convinced them that they could never keep any of those commands on their own. The, the entire nation should have, have, like the tax collector in Luke 18, cried out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But they didn't, for the most part. We, too, cannot keep that law. We, too, must cry out, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And the good news, the good news is if we are in Christ, his righteousness, right? His keeping this command has been credited to our account. And because of that, we will truly desire and strive to keep this command ourselves. We want to see ourselves grow in our love for God. 
And so the foremost command, love God with everything you are, with everything you have. If that's not hard enough, Jesus continues, doesn't he? What does he say in verse 31? The second greatest commandment is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandments greater than these. Wouldn't it have been hard enough if Jesus would have just stopped with the first commandment? And, and, and the scribe only asked about the foremost commandment, but Jesus gives him a second as well. He quotes from Le, Le, uh, Leviticus chapter 19. But these two commandments are so intimately related. They belong together. It, those who truly love God will love those who are created in God's image. Those who truly love God are reckoned to be his children and are to reflect his divine nature, which is what? Love. And, and, and so the pairing of these two commands, to love God and, and to love others, finds its pattern even in the Ten Commandments, right? The first four commandments relating to love for God, the last six relating to love for fellow human beings. But if you read this, if you look at this, if you think about it, anyone who does not show love to their neighbor can't claim to love God. If you hate your neighbor, if you're bitter, if you bear grudges, if you seek vengeance, you cannot claim to love God. We're to love others. We're to love our neighbors. How are we to do this? What's the standard? As we love ourselves, right? No, that's not a call for self-love, no. Biblically, there is no call to self-love. Uh, biblically, it takes for granted that you love yourself. How many of you took care of yourself this morning before you came to church? Any of you eat something, get something to drink, cup of coffee? Some of you combed your hair, maybe others didn't, I don't know. But you take care of yourself, you look after yourself, you do what's in your own best interests. That's the same kind of care we're to extend to others. To, to love others as ourselves means we're to love our neighbor in the manner that we already take care of and provide for our own needs. We're to have the same love and care for others that we have for ourselves. And loving God himself is the foundation for loving our neighbor. For the Jews of Jesus' day, love for one's neighbor meant fellow Jews. But... As you well know, Jesus extended the definition of neighbor to include who? Even one's enemies, right? The parable of the Good Samaritan, your neighbor is anyone around you who has needs. So don't say you love God if you don't love people, even difficult people. How many of us can say I've Love God with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my, my strength, and, and I love my neighbor as myself. None of us. We can't live this perfectly, but we want it desperately. Why? Because Jesus says love is to be our priority. He, he, he finishes verse 31 there. He says, there is no other commandment greater than these. Uh, Matthew records that Jesus said, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. That is, all of Scripture depends on these laws. And so the scribe asks his question. Jesus gives the answer. And what's the response? Verse 32 and 33. The scribe said to him, Right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. You know, only Mark includes this positive response by the scribe and, and, and Jesus' praise of it. And I think this man's answer confirms that he, he no longer has devious purposes in questioning Jesus. And, and once again, we see that when not motivated by pride and, and, and hypocrisy, even some of the religious leaders recognize that Jesus' wisdom is from God. And so the scribe here acknowledges that Jesus has answered truly. He's answered beautifully. 
And then when he recites back Deuteronomy 6, 5, uh, 6, 5 he, he omits with all your soul and he replaces mind with understanding, but uh, don't get hung up on any of that. He's confirming everything that Jesus just said. As a whole, it means to love God with all your being, with everything you have. And then he expands on, uh, on the, uh, the, the whole loving God is more important, loving your neighbor is more important. He expands on that. He says that's more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And, and I think those two terms summarize, represent the entire sacrificial system. He's saying, Jesus, you are right. Loving God and loving your neighbor is more important than all these other things. And that's not a new thought. That's common throughout the Old Testament, emphasizing the importance of a relationship of love with God, obedience to him over external rituals and activities. We're to be dedicated completely. We're to be consumed with, sold out for, in love with our God. And our love for God will be seen in our love for our neighbor. And all of this is more important than, than religious observances. In 1 Samuel 15, we read, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, to heed than the fat of rams. To love God, to love our neighbor is more important than the sacrifices. What's the result of this interchange between Jesus and this scribe? Verse 34, when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. You know, Jesus is impressed with the man's discernment, with his priorities, and he commends him. Jesus says, you answered intelligently. I never had a teacher ever tell me that, but... <laughs> Jesus tells this man, you're not far from God's kingdom. And if you remember, God's, the, the kingdom of God has been central to, to Jesus' teaching throughout Mark's gospel. Essentially, it means you know, submission to God's rule, his values, his purposes in the world. And Jesus doesn't identify the scribe as belonging to the kingdom of God yet. He's saying he's close and he's moving in the right direction. He's not far from. But even though he's close, he's not in yet, is he? You know, once again, it's possible to be within an inch of the kingdom of God, within an inch of heaven, and yet end up in hell. This scribe, like all of us, needs to cross that line of faith. And yet, you know, I'll, I'll give you my opinion. I think that we'll meet this scribe in heaven. I can't give you a biblical basis for that, but that's, that's my belief. But he stands in stark contrast to, to the rich man, right? The rich young ruler, Mark 10. His riches were a crippling hindrance for him entering the kingdom. He turned away. He went a different path. To be in God's kingdom, one has to do more than simply approve of Jesus' teaching. One has to submit to his authority and to what he has done for us. So, so can this scribe make the next step? Can he accept Jesus as the son of David and David's Lord? We don't know. We're left to wonder. It doesn't say. But he understood that the key that unlocked the door to the kingdom of God was love for God and love for neighbors. If this scribe would, by God's grace and by God's power, take one more step and believe in Jesus as his Savior and Lord, he'd move from a position of being not far to being in. And the way Jesus phrases this, I believe he's urging him to do that very thing. And yet, you know, this is one of the greatest dangers each and every one of us face, to be near but not in the kingdom. To be a tear and not wheat. To be lukewarm, not hot. To sprout up but produce no fruit. To think we've done much for Jesus, but yet to hear him say what? Depart from me, I never knew you. I mean, this scribe is near, but he's not in. We cannot love our way into the kingdom either. We can't love God in our own strength. 
We have to be born again. We have to be given a new heart that's saturated with the love of God for us. We have to be filled with his spirit. We have to, to walk according to his word, to love him the way he commands us to. And perhaps today you need to repent of the things that are competing with your love for God. A true believer loves God, loves his word, loves his people, rejects the world, longs to be with him. Lovers of God want to obey him. And it's when we see something in our lives where we're disobeying his word that we do something about it. We confess, we repent, we deal with our sin. And then we walk in obedience because we love him. And we never want his wholehearted love for us to be returned with just a half-hearted love on our part. The episode concludes there in verse 34 that no one would venture to ask Jesus any more questions. And you know, that, that might seem a bit surprising after such a positive exchange with this scribe. But I believe it refers not just to this one event, but to the whole series of controversies that we've seen these past few weeks. Jesus has decisively answered every challenge with authority. And he's going to next respond with a question of his own, one that they could not answer. We'll get to that. But these two laws, love God and love others, are the greatest because they epitomize the nature and character of God himself. And it's that from which all of other, uh, God's other laws arise. You know, obedience to God, loving God, isn't just about making sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed. No. We're not making ourselves worthy to enter the kingdom. We can't do that. Our obedience comes from a heart that's experienced God's love for us, his amazing grace. He's transformed us. He's given us a, a new heart. As Paul puts it, it's Christ's love, not merely a sense of duty, that controls him and drives him forward in obedience. His great passion is to know him. Is that your passion? To know him? To love him? And again, the scribe reminds us that not all of Israel's religious authorities rejected Jesus. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, right? They became his followers. Book of Acts shows that, that some Pharisees are positively disposed towards the Christians. Many priests actually come to a saving knowledge and believe. James reports to Paul that many thousands of law-keeping Jews believed in the gospel. As Paul points out, a remnant has been saved even if a majority is turned away. And so even here with this scribe, hope and opportunity remain. If we're to believe God's word, if we're to believe the testimony of John Wesley, we have to take to heart this truth. While the scribe and John Wesley weren't far from the kingdom, they were still outside the kingdom. Being almost there is not being there. As, as some of you, I won't ask you who, some of you remember uh, Evil Knievel when he tried to jump the Snake River Canyon in his sky cycle? Do you realize that was 50 years ago this September when he did that? <laughs> anyway, he went up, a burst of power, fizzled out over the canyon, landed in the river after deploying his parachute. You know, making it partway is not making it. Even one inch short isn't making it. Remember the continental divide we talked about last week? Two rain drip, uh, rain drips, rain drops. Inches apart can end up oceans apart. If the scribe does enter the kingdom of God, it's because he submits to the logic of his own words. What he admits is true. Loving God is more important than the entire ceremonial system. Maybe he had attempted to love God with all his heart and failed. He realized that he, he, perhaps he realized he could never achieve the moral excellence that the law demanded of him. And he realized that he was a sinner. Hopefully, seeing himself for what he was, he casts himself on the mercy of God and finds salvation. You know, when a religious person sees and acknowledges the seriousness of their sin, that's a great day. 
Sir James Simpson was the discoverer of chloroform. But he used to say that the greatest find he ever made was learning that he was a sinner and that Jesus was just the Savior he needed. That kind of discovery leads to casting oneself on the mercy of God, the love of God, receiving the gift of faith that he gives us, repentance and salvation. And that's exactly what happened to John Wesley as well. His, his time here in America had brought him to the end of himself. His conversation with the Moravian Christians brought conviction of his failure. As a matter of fact, on one occasion as he talked with them, he heard them speaking about personal faith as a gift from God. When he asked how this could be, using his words, he said this, They replied with one mouth that this faith was a gift, the free gift of God, and that he would surely bestow it upon every soul who earnestly and perseveringly sought it. After that meeting, Wesley wrote these words, I resolved to seek it to the end. And then on May 24, 1738, he opened his Bible and read, You are not far from the kingdom of God. Evening came. In his journal, it tells the story, quote, In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warm. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death, end quote. He moved from not far from God's kingdom to being a citizen, a child of that kingdom. Uh, the rest of Wesley's story is well known. He, he became a, a force of nature. He preached in St. Mary's there in Oxford. He preached in churches, in mines, in fields, on the streets. He preached on horseback. He preached on his father's tombstone once. You know that? In his life, it's, uh, he, he gave about 42,000 sermons. That's a lot of preaching. It's oftentimes preaching three times a day. That's exhausting. You know, read his life, read his biographies, and you'll find an amazing story of a love for God and a love for his lost neighbors as well. So what are the lessons of all this for us? Well, it's possible to have grown up in the church. It's possible to have godly parents, and yet yourself never have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. It's also possible to have studied theology, to, to know the scriptures as the scribe and Wesley did, and still be unsaved. It's even possible to have heard the grace and the gospel of Jesus preached all your life and still be resting on your own goodness. It's entirely possible to become hardened to the gospel, to seal your damnation even while you're attending church. It's possible to fool everyone. It's even possible to have the preacher preach your funeral and assure everyone that your soul is in heaven when it's really in hell. That's possible. In other words, it's possible to be within an inch of the kingdom and still be outside of it. Are you near to the kingdom? Are you not far from the kingdom but not yet in? A single step can make all the difference, can it? Have you made that step? Have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? If so, a sign of that is you love God. You love your neighbors. And it'll be an instinct. It'll be part of who you are, the DNA of your life. That's our goal, isn't it? To glorify God in how we approach everything, to show him our love in everything we do. Don't give God just a sliver of your time or your life or your strength or your mind. No. Don't think some external act is, is, is enough. Okay, I read my Bible for five minutes. I prayed for five minutes. I'm done. I'm good. I'm good with God. I showed him my love. You know, you can't deceive God. And our relationship with him is to be all-encompassing. That's what Jesus says here. And let that be true of us, people who are holy, who are completely devoted to him in everything, every conversation, every task, every relationship that we encounter. You know, I encourage you, pray with me that we would love God and love each other as we're commanded and empowered to do. Let's pray before we come to the communion table. Father, we come before you admitting that we do not love you as we should. We do not love our neighbors as we should. 
Father, we don't even love each other within the church as we should. But Father, we desire to. Father, help us to love you more day by day. Help us to love one another. Help us to love our neighbors, whoever that you might bring into our path. Father, we realize that this does not bring us salvation. You bring us salvation in what you did in sending your son to die in our place. In your love for us, you sent your son who gave his life, his sinless life, his life in which he loved you perfectly. He gave it up in our place. He took the punishment of our sins upon himself so that we might have a relationship with you. And so even as we come to the table this morning, we thank you. We mourn our sin that put Jesus there, and yet we are grateful, joyfully grateful, for your plan of salvation for us. And so as we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, may we once again be reminded of what you have done for us, because you love us. And may we be encouraged in our love for you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.